Um, thanks so much. I uh, am one of probably the most furthest away guests today, and I'm really honored to be here on behalf of the Center for Ocean Solutions. I'm um, talking a little bit about the work I'm doing there, but also some previous research I did for my postdoctoral work at the University of British Columbia. And we're going to switch it up and move away from coral reefs and in, into uh, more temperate systems. But before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the work I'm going to be talking about today is a collaborative effort with a group of scientists from the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, as well as a group of other folks from across the US and Canada examining uh, how to embed the science of tipping points into decision making. As well as a focus on a case study that I worked on again for my postdoctoral work at the University of British Columbia, looking at ecosystem services uh, in the Northeast Pacific, led by Kai Chan from the University uh, of British Columbia. So tipping points, what do I mean by that? I think uh, several references have been made to thresholds or tipping points in systems. And I think a lot of people think about them in different ways. And this is the definition we've been working from as a group uh, for tipping points in systems. So when incremental changes in human use or environmental conditions can result in these large and abrupt changes in ecosystem structure function, and ultimately benefits to people. And so this can look and manifest in multiple ways. Um, one way is that the underlying driver, and these are driver on the x-axis uh, and environmental response on the y. Uh, and what some of these dynamics can be actually uh, that the underlying driver exhibits thresholds, but the relationship between the driver and the response variable is actually linear. Um, alternatively, you might have a relationship between the driver and response variable that's nonlinear, and so you still see these threshold dynamics. And then ultimately, one that I think is probably the most concerning and something that people are thinking about a lot, and even Pete brought up in his talk, is this idea of nonlinearity with hysteresis, where you see the re relationship between the driver and the response variable change after the shift. And so this can lead to um, difficulty or uh, differences when trying to recover after a, sh a shift has already occurred. And I just want to keep these in mind because I think it's important when thinking about managing systems that depending on what type of driver response you have, you can have very different outcomes in your system. So we've been looking at a number of cases around the world and after ex examining the literature, we found that a wide variety of marine habitats are experiencing these shifts of, of all these types everything from intertidal systems to the open ocean, and they're um, manifesting uh, around the globe. So they're quite common. And the reason we should care is that, again, as I mentioned, recovery may be difficult and slow. And again, this could be because it's very difficult to shift the driver or the system once the driver is already in place. There might be ecological feedbacks in place that prevent the recovery or, or again, make it more difficult to recover. And I think one that I'll be talking about in more detail here with this case today is that the feedback mechanism, mechanisms might actually be in the social system themselves. So the social ecological uh, relationship may also prevent recovery or, again, make it more challenging. So again, why should we care about these? Well, they might be rapid, unexpected, and difficult to reverse. They can have negative consequences for people's livelihoods. And I'm going to be talking about this in the context of temperate reefs in the Northeast Pacific. And hopefully, the ability to predict and understand the effects of tipping points can begin to enhance decision making uh, and help us really inform the process so that we can begin to understand these feedbacks and potentially overcome them. So the, the case I'll be presenting today is focused on a, a very well-known uh, tipping point where we see shifts from kelp-dominated temperate reefs to urchin-dominated temperate reefs. And these are driven in the Northeast Pacific primarily by this driver, uh, the predation rates by sea otters. And the reason you probably all are familiar with this case, it's a very well-known trophic cascade, that this occurs is that sea otters have very high metabolic rates in order to stay warm in cold climates. They are the only marine mammal without blubber. And so this makes them highly effective predators. And their major prey item is the sea urchin, which I was trying to go back, there you go you can see there is, is a highly tasty <laughs> organism for these guys. And so this again is that, that well-known trophic cascade where by preying on sea urchins, sea otters indirectly facilitate the productivity and size of kelp forests. 
And this is shown here by some data that we put together with this tipping points group across the Northeast Pacific, where you see that the relationship between sea urchins and kelps is one that's uh, highly uh, nonlinear, where you get high uh, evidence of, or high densities of urchins really precludes kelps, whereas very low sea urchin populations tends to be where you see high densities of kelp um, per meter square. And interestingly, if we start to under, try to understand the driver of these, these sea otters, we find that there's this nonlinear dynamic with hysteresis that occurs. And these are data from Jim Estes' work uh, in, the, in Alaska, where we've identified, this pointer doesn't work, that's unfortunate. Let's see if this will work, aha. Where you can see that the relationship between otter density, as if you're in a kelp forest dominated system, you can identify the threshold density below which you shift to a sea urchin dominated system. Alternatively, if you're in an urchin dominated system and you're trying to get back to a kelp forest dominated system, it actually takes more otters per unit squared to overcome those feedbacks that have, that have taken place in, in the system. And so we do see this, this nonlinear dynamic with hysteresis. And this can really help us to identify the expectations for recovery or maintenance of these different regimes, depending on people's preferences. Sorry. So the primary state that most of these Northeast Pacific systems is in is one that is actually uh, urchin dominated. And this has been primarily driven by the loss of sea otters across their range due to the North Pacific maritime fur trade, which happened in the mid to late 1700s through the 1800s. And sea otters were um, essentially uh, eliminated to ecological extinction. This is their current and historic range of the sea otter across the Northeast Pacific. And in the mid 1800s, early 1900s, otters were completely extinct except for in these two regions, the Aleutian Islands and Alaska and Big Sur, California. So essentially this became an endangered species and one that was ecologically extinct for most of the, the region. And in their absence, the, their main prey, the sea urchin, became super abundant and um, shifted from kelp forest dominated to these urchin dominated systems. In addition to the loss of sea urchin, excuse me, the, the super abundance of sea urchins, other um, invertebrate prey that were um, focused on, that were preyed on by sea otters were also released. So things like gooey duck, clams, abalone, dungeness crab. And in the 200 year absence of sea otters, um, these became particularly important for people. Commercial fisheries diversified into these invertebrate species in part due to the loss of fin fish and other changes in the system. And coastal communities became dependent on these altered uh, ecosystems. But as I mentioned, these fisheries are really only viable in the absence of sea otters. So what's happened is this setup for conflict and this is basically a conflict between conservation and fisheries. So in the 1980s, if we fast forward post decline of sea otters, um, conservation community became very concerned about their endangered species status and started relocating uh, sea otters from the Aleutians into parts of Canada. And they were touting this as you know, recovery of natural ecosystems, the importance of existence value of otters and the potential for tourism benefits. But there was a rapid shellfish population declines, which led to economic loss, as well as the culture and traditional loss um, of these important species for um, First Nations communities in British Columbia. So it's led to this um, huge conflict. You've started to see poaching of sea otters in places where they're becoming recovered, as well as really important um, impacts on coastal people. But the the question is bigger than this trophic cascade, and I use this um, diagram just to illustrate the point that these trophic cascades are embedded in larger ecosystems and larger social ecological systems. So it's important to really understand, well, what are the full suites of costs and benefits that are associated with these different regimes? Because while we see these losses in fisheries from the shellfish perspective, there may be um, other benefits that are associated with kelp forest ecosystems that might be important to identify or to quantify in order to really inform this, this conversation. So this is what we've been focusing on with uh, our work uh, in, at UBC, trying to understand the consequences of these regime shifts for people and for ecosystems. And we focused on this region off the west coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada, 
And we used a space for time substitution where areas that sea otters have been present actually now for more than 40 years, but we know that all the sites that we looked at have had otter occupation for at least 15 to 20. Areas where they've expanded into other parts of their range for less than five years, and areas where they've remained absent over time. And using subtitle um, transects to get at density and size of kelp, invertebrate, and fishes, we examine how different ecosystem states with and without sea otters support different subtitle communities. So this is what we've found. Unsurprisingly, we see this strong top-down effect of sea otters on large grazers, where in areas where they've been absent, um, these organisms that have very high biomass, biomass is here on the Y, and areas where they've even been present for less than five years, you see a very rapid decline in abundance of these prey items. Similarly, see, we, we see this concomitant increase in the um, biomass of perennial kelps with sea otters, particularly where they've been present for more than 15 years. And interestingly, we start to see this bottom-up effect of kelp and sea otters on some of these other important grazers in the system, small molluscan grazers and small decapod crustaceans, which are in turn important food sources for other species in the food web, particularly these kelp forest-associated fisheries, fish species, which are also important targets for fisheries, including rockfish and lingcod, uh, as well as kelp greenling and perch. So we do see this major changes in the ecosystem beyond the actual trophic cascade. So that's all well and good, but what does that mean for people? And we've been working in this system using semi-structured interviews to try to understand how people might see themselves as affected by this and what their, their primary values are. And just to briefly kind of summarize this, what we found, not surprisingly, is that ecological changes affect people in different ways and that people might differ in their ability to adapt to these changes. And this is a woman, Natalie Jack, from Cayucat, which is that area where otters have been present for more than 20 years. And if you ask the First Nations people in that community how they've been affected, they, they've actually been affected very negatively. They are very culturally tied to shellfish in that region. They're very isolated. There aren't a lot of opportunities for livelihood um, diversification. And so they've felt this impact very greatly. They don't have a lot of capacity for adaptation uh, into other um, resource extraction, and so it has been, had a major impact on them. But if you move south into the area where otters are still absent and you talk to the Huheyat First Nation, they're actually looking forward to the return of the sea otter because they have the ability and the infrastructure to take advantage of the sea otters as tourist opportunities. And this is in part because of where they're located, it's in part because of some of their institutional capacity as well as they don't have a very strong tie to some of these invertebrate resources for some reason, which we're still trying to understand. So because of this interest in tourism, both from the First Nations there, but also other people, what we've been trying to identify, and people talk about this as a benefit all the time, but no one's actually quantified this particular service associated with sea otters. So we've also been um, trying to get at this by using a choice experiment methodol methodology where trying to identify the value of encountering sea otters on wildlife tours. And so I don't know if you're familiar with choice experiment methodology, but basically you uh, offer people different scenarios that vary a certain set of attributes, and you can start to identify um, which of these attributes is really driving their choices and then get some economic value affiliated with that. And so we use these on the west coast of Vancouver Island with tourists. We uh, received about 400 responses. And the take home is that basically using this um, methodology, we could identify the probability of people going on a wildlife tour, choosing to go on it based on the sort of base case, which is a 33% probability of seeing a sea otter on a wildlife tour. If we then uh, model the likelihood of that going down to zero or going up to 100%, having a very high likelihood of seeing those otters depending on their abundance, we can actually see the shifts in the number of people or the probability of someone actually choosing to go on that tour. And then using some values from the tourism literature based on the average cost of wildlife viewing as well as the number of people that go to do these tours, we can estimate the loss in potential revenue to the tourism industry if otters decline and the gain in, in, in revenue if otters increase. 
So this is a way to start really trying to get at these values uh, and really understand the tourism value of otters. So we've been, as I mentioned before, trying to get at this full suite of costs and benefits that are associated with these regimes. And so we've been taking this information from our choice experiment as well as the field experiment and trying to populate a uh, model that quantifies uh, a full suite of benefits from these nearshore ecosystems. And so with the help of some folks working in this region to really try to understand what people care about and what they want to compare, we've been identifying a set of benefits that they're interested in. Then using an ecosystem model, it's uh, EcoPath with EcoSim that's been led by my colleague Ed Greger. We've been informing this model using our field work uh, of the, the space for time substitution to really try to get at what some of these benefits are. And so this includes uh, calculating fisheries change with and without sea otters based on landed values and the change in some of these key fisheries target species. Again, informing the tourism value from our projected changes in revenue. Trying to measure secondary production as sort of the system primary production exported as food. And so we've been kind of looking at where the, within the ecosystem model which of the nodes that this primary production is going to, is, is settling into with these changes and how this might be exported as landed values as well. And then finally, modeling carbon sequestration as primary production lost to the deep ocean. And so this is our preliminary results from this work and what this shows you is the sea otter induced change in ecosystem values. And so this is over a 10 year projection. And what we see is that um, again, this is value in millions on the, on the Y, is that we do see declines in overall value of fisheries catch because of the loss of shellfish, but we do see increases in some of these other services that might be important to people. What's missing here, and I think what's the real key next step, is to really understand the fact that even though these benefits might accrue from the presence of sea otters, the distribution of those benefits is not equal. So the people that are experiencing the costs, like the Cayucat First Nation, are not the ones that have the opportunity to actually take advantage of the benefits. So as I mentioned before, um, tourism value is very high and actually it's an industry that's very important in BC, but there's only one out of the 15 tour operators that's a First Nation uh, owned and operated. So you do see uh, this sort of inequity in the distribution of benefits. In addition, I think uh, something we've been working on with Terry and Josh Sinner from the ARC Center for Excellence is how do we start to tackle some of these other non-economic values and incorporate them into these types of uh, decision analyses. Because I think, again, the idea of losing your cultural identity is one that is hard to measure in terms of dollars. So just to wrap up my presentation for day, today and try to link the two pieces together, I think it's really important that we begin to understand these tipping points, again, because they're rapid because they have unintended consequences, but they also really begin to clarify what we might be able to do to address some of these conflicts and, and inform management. And so what I've shown today is that we can begin to quantify these metrics of regime state in order to serve as these benchmarks of ecological, ecological change. What are the expected outcomes if you're in one regime or another across the board? We can also begin to identify how these thresholds might suggest natural limits to regulate, set certain regulations and set expectations for recovery. So again, that idea of the hysteresis with sea otters, you might have very different expectations uh, depending on which regime you might want to be in in terms of your targets for management. Uh, I think importantly, management targets should be, can be and should be linked to ecosystem processes and really importantly, people's preferences. And then identifying this full suite of costs and benefits is really important for highlighting trade-offs associated with different management actions. So with that, I'll just say thank you. And again, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to meeting many of you over the next few days.